Okay, so uh, like many of us that are giving a sequence of three lectures, what I decided I would do was start the first one with a, a slightly more technological or techniques approach to explain, and this would also explain some of the background for the subsequent lectures. And for me, the technologies are going to be genetics. So what I'm going to do today is to talk specifically about go through genetic experiments that were directed at understanding the uh, mechanisms of development. And then I'm going to build on those tomorrow's lecture by using the results from those screens to set up a system that allows us to uh, study how transcription is patterned in the early embryo, how the information content in gradients specifically relates to cell fates. And we'll see how, uh, and then also how eukaryotic enhancers respond quantitatively to distinguish subtle levels in concentration to activate genes. And then on Friday, what I'd like to do, ooh, uh, Friday I'd like to talk about uh, uh, the actual downstream mechanics that produce morphological changes in the embryo. Now, all of that is going to be based a bit on the genetic analyses and the analysis of genes, identification of genes that's been carried out in Drosophila. I, uh, <clears throat> what I, uh, rather than just focusing on these particular problems, what I decided I would do is try to take a slightly more general approach to genetic mutagenesis experiments, uh, begin to address you know, basic questions of genome organization, how many genes, how one goes about identifying those genes, not just specifically with respect to embryonic patterning. And obviously, we all know the genomes are sequenced. You can identify from those sequences based on your knowledge, based on your sense of your ability to identify open reading frames or functional units in the genome, you can make calculations for the numbers of genes in the human genome. You can base that on molecular biology. You can base that on bioinformatics. What I'm going to talk about today is really estimates, give you a sense of the as how one approaches that particular problem with uh, genetic approaches. It obviously becomes more interesting if one watches, focuses on a particular project, a pro a pro and this, what we're looking at here is obviously is a Drosophila embryo from the early stages of development. It's a, uh, what you can see, uh, the, uh, what we'll be able to follow in this movie is morphological changes in the embryo. Here you can see this layer of nuclei on the surface of the embryo. There are about 6,000 nuclei at this stage. These nuclei become partitioned into cells. The embryo begins the process of gastrulation, where you can see individual the sheets of cells uh, moving, changing their morphology. Uh, the process, this uh, it's real time here, so I've sped up the movie. You have a sense when you do that, you visually have a sense of, uh, of movement and of force that you don't, and that gives you a certain interpretive insights into what's going on in the embryo. The processes, these processes are going to continue, and I'm actually showing you this movie in part because it's, um, I sped it up here, <laughs> just to give you a sense of how extraordinarily complex this process is. This, uh, the, the forming in intestines, the region of the embryo, these, the anterior and posterior intestines now fuse. There's, uh, this is the future brain of the embryo. You can see very small cells moving around, that begin to move around. These are hematocytes that are going to, uh, uh, that actually uh, uh, phagocytizing dead cells and cleaning up Debris, you can see now this internal gut uh, in the embryo. You can also will begin to see muscle movements in the embryo. Uh, 
He's become more vigorous. This is the mouth. This is the anus. This is the intestine. Uh, the embryo breathes through openings at the posterior. And you will see these now. They suddenly fill up with air. And the embryo can, uh, hatches and goes off into its happy life, one assumes. Now, you look at a process, and that's actually extraordinarily complex. And I, I could look at that movie, and I have actually looked at that movie many, many times. And I've made many movies <laughs> that are similar. In, uh, and I've looked at all of those. So I can, I can actually never lose uh, the enthusiasm of watching those processes. And I, I send you all a copy, and you can spend your time in the lab looking at the movies. But what one really wants to know, though, when you look at processes, is you want to know how they happen, how they're governed. What is it that gets, sets up spatial pattern? Why does a fold happen here? Why do these? Uh, it, why, how, why does a fold happen here? Breaks down into two questions. What makes this region different? What are the gene products specifically involved in programming cells to, it, to a, a specific region to make a specific fold? But there's also then, why does the fold form here? <laughs> What's the relationship between those programming decisions and the actual mechanics to produce the movement that you've just seen? in the movie. So how do you actually mechanically transform the embryo? And we're going to try to approach that problem uh, using genetics. One of the major uh, challenges, though, for almost all, almost all truly beautiful embryonic developmental systems is that they are multicellular. And almost all multicellular organisms are Deployed, and so what I wanted to, s I guess, I guess one stands up here and advances. So just to put us all, I uh, put us all on the same page. What I'm, this is going to start out, this lecture is going to start out fairly simple, but uh, and, and may get, may or may not get more complicated. Who knows? Um, one of the features, though, is that. Multicellular organisms are diploid. That means that, that we have two copies of each chromosome, one we inherit from our fathers, one we inherit from our mothers. And we know, and especially in flies, we know that from a number of genetic experiments that invariably one of those two copies is enough. And even though you have two copies, if you have a single wild-type allele, you will uh, develop normally. What that means, uh, so we would write that as m over plus is viable, even if the gene m is essential. And what that means is that in the geneticist parlance, loss of function mutations are recessive to wild, to wild type. And, or you could say that wild type is dominant to most loss of function mutations. Now, that feature has two, that feature has two features. One, I would argue that it makes the genetic, genetic analyses of multicellular organisms much more easy than bacteria or uh, yeast or organisms that are haploid because you can make easily knockout mutations, destroy those mutations, and in a bacterial population, if a, a gene is essential, you destroy the mutation, that bacterial cell is lost among the million or so cells on your plate. And unless you develop clever selection protocols or special kinds of mutations that allow you to detect and work with these, you're going to lose. It's much more difficult to obtain and maintain loss of function mutations in a haploid organism than a diploid organism. The bad side, of course, is that diploids make organisms, uh, make genetics difficult because if any new mutation you produce is recessive, what that means is that you will not see the consequence in the individual in which that mutation arises. You will only be able to see the consequences by making an individual what we call homozygous. <coughs> 
To make homozygotes, you have to cross heterozygotes. So if you cross two heterozygotes, you produce one quarter homozygotes. And so what that means is you'll see, and I'm going to walk you through a mutagenesis experiment in Drosophila, you'll see that the major complication is setting up a series of crosses that allow you to reproducibly produce homozygous, both to maintain a, a new mutation as a heterozygous stock, but also to cross individuals to produce a homozygous uh, individuals that you can recognize phenotypes. And I'm going to do this experiment in Drosophila. And I'm going to start with one particular chromosome. Drosophila has four pairs of chromosomes. That's eight chromosomes. It's a diploid. The, the haploid number is four. The second chromosome is one of the largest of these chromosomes. It represents about 40% of the total genome. So that's a good opportunity. What we're going to do is we're going to try to ask how many essential functions are localized to the second uh, second chromosome. We're going to do that by a mutagenesis experiment. And we're going to, and the essential idea is that we are going to start this set of series of crosses with uh, <clears throat> two different strains that are essentially normal, the normal wild type females and flies which are carry males, which are homozygous for some eye color markers. And these will just help us follow the homozygous for this individual through the whole through our, our crossing scheme. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take these males that are already mature and have produced lots of haploid sperm and are waiting to mate with females. We're going to treat them with a chemical mutagen which induces single base pair changes. And this mutagen and the procedures that have been developed in flies are Strong, basically, what they do is they increase. They are random mutagens, so they're going to cha randomly change bases in the DNA. And they change the frequency with which that happens from about 1 in 10 to the 6 spontaneously. Ah, no, better explain. But what this does is it increases the probability of getting a mutation in any gene, in the average gene from something like 1 in a million, 1 in 10 to the 6th, to about 1 in 10, uh, 1 in 1,000. So we're going to threefold increase in the efficiency with which we produce mutations. This number, 1 in 1,000, is actually useful because if you think about it, it's the probability if you treat in sperm with this mutagen, and you, there are 1,000 sperm that if you can sample those 1,000 sperm, there is a good chance that you have, there's, you've had induced a mutation in the gene, uh, any gene that you're interested in. So one in 1,000 is not 1,000 flies, is a lot of flies, but it's not a lot. And it's that property, the power, uh, the ease with which you can induce mutations one to, that allows us to do these experiments. It's very strange to be up here giving this lecture and having most of you nod. And I feel um, you're kind of with me because I feel like I'm going really slow, but I'm happy to go slow. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes? And get the temperature, or the, get, the, get the frequency even higher than one in a thousand. The two things. Fly, the what you do is you put lace, you make a little bottle, you make sugar water, you put some Kleenex in there, and you soak the water with Kleenex, you dump all these males in, you make them really thirsty. And if you add too much of the chemical, they don't really like to drink it. So you have to sneak it in, and there's a limit to how much sugar water you can add. Uh, there's, uh, I, that's largely in our, it, it, there's also a secondary thing that even if they eat it, they begin eventually to get sick and are sterile. So this is about as high as, as we've gone uh, in, in terms of concentrations and efficiencies. More questions? OK. So the basic idea 
is then that we take these males, we mate them with females, and we obtain an F1. And these F1s are heterozygous for mutations. Are we going to be able to see any phenotype? The group answers loudly, no, because the loss of function mutations are generally recessive. What if we cross these F1s with each other and get an F2? Are we going to be able to see a phenotype? Do we say yes? How many vote yes? How many vote no? OK, good. All right. So there's a problem, though, in doing this. Remember, we fed these males this chemical mutagen. Individual sperm have been affected, and they've produced an F1. Each F1 fly is derived from a different sperm. And that sperm, by chance, may or may not have had a mutation in any particular gene. So what that means is that you can't just cross the F1s. Because each of these individuals is a single individual with a, a new mutation. So the big job that you have is to take this, each of these single individuals and convert them into multiple male and female heterozygotes that can cross with each other and produce homozygotes. set up little separate inbred lines where you take individual males and mate them make individual by mating single males with normal females. OK? And then we get another generation. And now what we have are males and females that are heterozygous for the same mutation. Whatever mutation was on the second chromosome of this individual uh, <coughs> will um, uh, you have individuals that are heterozygous. You'll also have some other flies here. We'll talk about those just a tiny bit later. We now can allow these flies to mate with each other. And in the next generation, which is the third generation, we will produce a progeny, one quarter of which is now homozygous for our original white-eyed colored mutation. And if these white-eyed flies survive, it means that on that particular second chromosome in that particular male, we did not produce a mutation in the gene that was essential for viability. If they die, we can get excited. We look at this tube in which this little family has been living for two generations. We see no white-eyed flies, and we're happy because we know on the second chromosome we've induced a mutation. Now, there are, that's the basic idea of the screen. There are two flaws, or two problems. One, and this is, relates to a problem that uh, Mayan uh, in, introduced this morning, is that um, <clears throat> in these, in the, we randomly, potentially, produced a mutation on the second chromosome anywhere. In this F1 or this F2 indi individual, you could have recombination. What recombination would do would be to yield a chromosome that still had the cinnabar brown markers, but didn't have uh, the lethal, new lethal mutation that you induced. What that means is that in this generation, you, you'll see some white-eyed flies, and you'll throw out the tube even though you've produced a lethal mutation. And the probability of this, this, this recombination is high enough along the entire X chromosome it's going to do, that you're only going to keep any genes that happen to be induced very close to your markers. So what you need to do is to have some way of keeping this chromosome intact. And the way that that's done in Drosophila is <clears throat> to prevent recombination. You prevent recombination. Recombination cannot productively occur between two chromosomes which have different sequences 
or inverted se sequences that are inverted relative to each other. So in Drosophila, we have a number of such chromosomes. They're called balancers because they can be used to balance chromosomes or keep those chromosomes intact. And we're going to have to redesign this cross to introduce these essentially wild-type chromosomes into our background. So whenever we have a wild-type, uh, uh, <coughs> many of the wild-type chromosomes, they will be overbalancers. And then if we produce a new mutation here, we won't see uh, that mutation will remain coupled to the cinnabar brown. And so here, if the cinnabar brown individuals, if we have a mutation, all of the cinnabar brown individuals will die. This allows us then to focus our mutagenesis on this entire chromosome intact. And that will be important later for the math when we go through what the actual results are. There's, uh, One other problem is that, and I could, uh, if you, is that if we take these individuals, even if they're balanced, we have, this is the new mutation, this is an, a balancer individual over a wild type chromosome, we're, uh, we're producing these wild type flies that we don't want. And if you're a good geneticist, and there are enough other markers floating around, you could dump out the flies from each tube and sort out the males and females before they've had a chance to mate with each other, throw these guys out, and keep these guys. If you want to do this experiment on a big scale, you have to figure out some way of killing these guys off. And the way that is done is that you introduce dominant mutations that are temperature sensitive and will kill off any heterozygote that has that mutation. So we're going to introduce it here. And then in the next generation, we'll produce individuals that are heterozygous. For the, we'll also produce individuals that get this dominant temperature sensitive mutation over the balancer, or over the, but these all die. And so now what we've been able to do is take a single male, put it in a tube with some females, and carry it through two generations, and then come back and look at the tube and say, are there any white-eyed flies in the tube? If there are no white-eyed flies in the tube, we can say it's a successful mutation. We will keep that tube, because the only flies that will be in that tube will be the heterozygotes that will continue to carry the mutation. That's the basic strategy that is used to um, uh, identif to, to identify mutations, essential mutations that are essential for viability. Now, I've told you that the mutagen we're using produces mutations uh, with a probability of about one mutation, uh, for any given gene, about one mutation per thousand sperm or per thousand chromosomes. That means that if we want to do a mutagenesis screen where we say, we want to identify mutations in every gene. And we want to be sure that we've looked at enough tubes that we've had, that we've actually uh, random by this random sort of that we've, we have actually examined or knocked out every mutation. We need to do this cross on a scale of about four to 5,000 chromosomes. And you could. Uh, calculate that more precisely with the Poisson, but uh, so, yeah, question. So if you, if you have one in a thousand chromosomes, you can mutate in the gene. Every time you do this, you mutate in the gene. And I guess the implicit yeah. assumption is that the chances are they only, you only eat one the most that will give you a phenotype. Right. OK, so one of the things that worried us was if you we don't know. Let's imagine that if there are only a thousand chromosomes, a thousand genes on the second chromosome, and you use this mutagenic dose, you will have some chromosomes that have no mutations, some that have one mutation, some that have two mutations, some that have three mutations. Yeah, you can maybe deal with that. If there are 10,000 genes, 
on the second chromosome, then you can do the calculation. And most of these second chromosomes will have meaning mutations. So before you do the experiment, you don't know. We made some good guesses. But uh, essentially, what we were hoping was the answer that you, that you pointed out, that even if there were many, many genes, that ultimately, for what we were going to be interested in, there would be a small number, and that we could sort those out. OK. So, so this is how the experiment actually, this is the experiment for the second chromosome. And this is how the numbers actually look. We set up 5,764 little tubes with males and females in it, in the F1. And, care, and this is an efficient dose of mutagen. And so after two generations, we checked the 4,217 had no white-eyed flies, no, no surviving. And what that tells us is that we had at least induced at least one mutation in these lines. So you'd like to really know how many mutations. And if you assume that the, the lethal mutations that you've induced are Poisson distributed and they have equal probability, then you can calculate that in these 400 and 4,217 lines, there are something like 7,500 lethal mutations. Next question you'd like to know is how many of these genes are, these are all genes, these are mutations in genes that are essential at some point during the life cycle of the animal, because they die before you get to be the adult. So you'd like to know how many are essential in the embryo itself. And what we did there was just set up these lethal lines, collect embryos from them, and ask what fraction of the lines produce 25% dead embryos. And we counted those as leth lethalities. And what we found, this is our first big result, was that if you, if you think of these 7,500 mutations as sampling the gene uh, population, essential gene populations in the individual, that what we found was about 20% cause death to embryos, and 80%, even though the animal is going to die sometime, that that gene that we had eliminated was not essential in the embryo for viability. So we're already reducing down the number of genes that are essential. So it's only one-fifth. If we did the next step, though, and looked at these dead embryos and say, how did they die? Or do they die in, <laughs> is, it, did it, was this gene essential for the embryo to achieve normal morphology? The number falls even more. And 272 of these lines, essentially 272 lines by this point, have lethal mutations produce embryos with distinct phenotypes. And what that meant was that they look different enough from wild type that we could say, ah, there is something repeating here in this collection. Sometimes these embryos didn't have any skin. Sometimes they didn't have any head. Sometimes they had multiple duplicated structures in the wrong places. A whole range of possible bad things that could happen. But the nice, uh, that's a, this is 100 and uh, this was a limited subset, though, of all the bad things that you could imagine would happen. So you could then say these are 272 lethal mutations. Say how many genes are affected. All 172 could be mutations in the same gene. Or many of them could be, there could be a thousand different genes. And we've sampled, and we have 172 of them, and we have one mutation in each. I'm going to stop and say, how would you solve this problem? How would you decide how many genes rather than mutations? Um, what we want to know is we have a tube A, dead embryos. A tube B, dead embryos in, when the chromosomes are homozygous. You'd like to know if the mutation in tube A killed the same knocked out the same gene as the mutation in tube B. What would you do 
in that kind of test, you would cross them with each other. And so I'm going to ask you really simple questions that are going to go really, really slow unless you immediately shout out the obvious answer. OK? Don't be shy. That will speed us up. All right, so you do what's called a complementation test. If line one and line two are both lethal in homozygotes but viable in heterozygotes, you cross these two together, you produce an individual which is M1 over M2. If this individual dies, it dies because you have knocked out that M1 and M2 have knocked out the same function. If M1, if this individual survives, it means that the two mutations are in different genes. So that the one chromosome can supply can, if what the other chromosome needs, it will complement. So this idea of complementation is the standard kind of thing that geneticists do to define gene. So actually, one of the words that we use for genes, we don't talk about genes, we talk about complementation groups. Because we arrange group fun uh, we arrange mutations in terms of complementing functions. Everybody with us so far? So when you do that, you find that these 272 mutations can be assigned to 61 complementation groups. That is 61 different genes on the second chromosome have activities that are essential for embryonic morphology. The, and you can also say something else, that the average number of mutations or new alleles in each of these, for each complementation group is 4.5. So you could say, what we want to know is, are these the only genes that will pass this test? Are there really only 61 genes on the second chromosome? An argument in favor of that is, well, that we have hit the average gene four times. What's the probability that we've hit, that, there, that there's a gene that we haven't hit at all? And if you make the assumption that all genes are on average about the same, have about the same mutability, it's, and try to math your way through that, it's a really small number. Another way of thinking about it, though, is just to look at what was happening in the experiment. This is actually a historical, um, yeah, this is actually a, like a diary of our life during that time when we were doing the experiments. And it's really plotting two things here. We're plotting the, we're setting up more and more crosses, you know, and looking, and uh, we're plotting in the dark spot, the frequency, uh, the, the number of new mutations that we identify. And because we're keeping the dose the same and every, this is kind of linear, and we just get more and more mutations with every tube we set up. We can also ask, how many new genes do we identify with each set of chromosome? And you can see that initially it was very exciting because we were getting lots of new genes and lots of new phenotypes and everything. And then at some point, this curve begins to flatten out. And right at about here, you might decide that you had something better to do with your life. And so we stopped. Because there may be another gene out there, but you would have to set up many, many, many more tubes to be able to identify it. OK, so we did that for the second chromosome. And we did that for all, uh, all the other chromosomes. And this is the end result, the characterization of the fly genome, what you can see is that ultimately, we end up with lots of, of lethal. We, uh, we end up with 566 mutations that produce kill embryos and produce distinct phenotypes. And they can be assigned to 121 complementation groups. Now, you can do a, a couple of things with that number. Since we know that we ask 
of, of these mutations, they represent about 3% of all of the mutations that we got. And if we take mutations to be representative of gene essential functions, we can say that genes that lead to embryonic morphological de defects represent 3% of all genes that are essential for viability. And that allows us then to calculate the total number of genes on the second chromosome that are essential for viability. That number is 380, 378. It's a calculated number rather than a real number. And what's interesting here is that, of course, if you look at the, the sequencing data, you have 13,000 open reading frames, 13,000 proteins that are constantly being selected for, for function and maintained as open reading frames in class. And yet when you knock these things out, only about a third of them result in homozygous knockouts in lethality. It turns out that we have this number for flies, but it's not unusual. It is probably comparable to what has been observed in mice and in humans. Now, you have another mice and worms and fish has not been done on humans. But what it's telling us is that when we look at this genomic data and we recognize proteins, the very, very large fraction encode functions that for some reason are being selected for, but do not have obvious consequences on viability when we remove them. It's an interesting challenge for us. We'll come through that a little bit in the lecture. Do we have questions? Yes. Ah, the word complement, ah, a complementation group is a, if you have mutations and you want to know if mutation A is in the same gene as mutation B, you perform a complementation test and you ask whether the function that's eliminated by A, mutation A, is the same function that's being eliminated by mutation B. And when two mutations fail to complement each other, that is, they die, we say that they both are mutant in the same function. They both are mutant in the same gene. So a complementation group is a way that geneticists define gene. And so we say that there are 21, 121 complementation groups on the second chromosome. 20, 121 genes whose function is essential for viability or for normal embryo. Another question. So um, this simple term to test every gene against every other gene. Yeah. Could be a very large number. What's the practicality? Of the okay, so the practical aspect here was that a 500, a 500 by 500 matrix would be pretty horrible. Uh, we already knew which chromosomes they were on. And so that kind of knowing where they were reduced the number of complementation tests. And actually what we did was we did two things. We looked at them and we first complemented everything, did complementation tests between everything that looked similar. And we and that allowed us, once we our rule was once something failed to complement. Once A failed to complement B, we no longer had to do complementation tests with B. We only had to do it with A. So by initially screening through based on morphology, we could reduce the potential number of complementation groups. And then we genetically mapped all of these mutations using the, well, the, the protocol that I described this morning to map them on chromosome. And then we mapped, we did complementation between any gene that within that was in 10 to 20 map units of any other gene, regardless of what its phenotype was. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Say that again. It contains. We would say it contains a single gene. It is the single gene. It is the because we have two point mutations which have removed that function. 
by we're going to assume that this um, mutagen mostly works by changing bases, and we know that's true. And so if you change the bases in DNA here and here, and you put uh, and they fail to complement. The only way that they would fail to complement is if they are disrupting the same function. And so a complementation, the failure to complement, is for us a, the definition of a gene. So a complementation group is one gene. Yes? Ah, so, ah. So here, these were the ones, so all that we, here we're doing a slightly different math. We are assuming that mutations sample the genome equally. And we had 18,136 lethal mutations. That is 18,000 genes, or 18,000 mutations that affected genes that were essential for viability. And we, uh, 566 or 3% of those vital, of those essential genes, were essential for embryonic patterning or embryonic morphology. And they constituted 121 genes. So if you take this ratio of mutations to be the ratio of genes, each mutation is in a gene, then the, the ratio of Embryonic morphology genes versus total viability genes is 3%. And if I told you that there were 121 embryonic morphology genes, you could calculate the total number of genes. That's what we did there. That's where that number comes from. Ah, because the markers that we're working with, this eye color, cinnabar brown, are two mutations on the second chromosome. If we, and we certainly did, induce on these sperm mutations in the third chromosome, on the X chromosome, on the fourth chromosome, and they were floating around independently of all the other things that we're looking at in the background of these stocks. But they're not impinging on the survival of the cinnabar brown white-eyed flies. So our only test was, do cinnabar brown white-eyed flies survive? Okay. I was just curious to know how you got the number of four point five genes per complement. Ah, because I had we had. Uh, let's go back one. Oh, going forward. That's what happens when you stand in front. Okay. If you divide, if you have five hundred and sixty-six mutations divided by 121 complementation groups, that's 4.5. Or actually, maybe the 4.5 was with specifically with the second chromosome. But you get the idea that you have so many complementation groups. Uh, you take all of these mutations and assign them to complementation groups. And you can ask, what's the average number? OK. No. OK. OK. So then we can ask this question, is 121 enough genes to build an embryo? Is this a sensible kind of result? Is this going to help? I was just going to help us think about this. And then you have to ask, well, where do embryos get the gene products that they need? And they get them from two different sources. The mother, when she makes the egg, supplies lots of RNAs and proteins in the egg. And the embryos, once they're fertilized and begin transcription, make gene products themselves. Those are the two sources. Sperm don't bring in gene products. So those are the two sources. And so, and then you could ask, what kinds of so we have these two sources, and the genetic screen that we've just done actually distinguishes between these two sources. 
it distinguishes between the two sources because we take it heterozygous normal females and males, mated them with each other. One quarter of the embryos are homozygotes, and the others are heteros, their brothers and sisters that come from the same mothers and the same father are heterozygotes. The heterozygotes survive, the homozygotes die. And that means that the determinant for viability is in the embryonic geno genome itself rather than in any maternal. Uh, these. So we're only able. So what we're really asking here, and this, this makes this experiment even a little bit cooler. We're saying, how many genes have to be, without being molecular biologists at all, and without doing expression arrays, we can say, how many genes have to be transcribed in the embryo for the embryo to survive? And that's the number 121. Now, uh, we can. Let's say this just makes sense. That's a good, good thing to ask yourself lots of times. And, and then you can say, well, what if the number's small? What is it? I mean, the embryo needs all these gene products. Uh, why doesn't it? Why doesn't the mother just supply everything? That's when you're, you know. Yeah, I, you know, when you're a young, a child could ask. I could see some people smiling. Why would mother wouldn't supply all gene products that the embryo needs? Why do we? There's clearly, you know, uh, there are six thousand RNAs detectable, and they're all supplied by the mother. What's the special feature of the hundred and twenty-one that need to be supplied by zygotic transcription? What does zygotic transcription do for you? And the answer is if you just need a gene product, you might as well get it from mom. Even if, and if you don't need a gene product, but somebody else in the egg needs the gene product, or some other, get it from mom. But if it's important that the gene product be expressed in these cells, but not these cells, and if those differences come down to single cell this difference, if the lack of the gene product has as much meaning as the presence of the gene product, then supplying it by transcription is great, is the right strategy. So then in a way, and so when later these genes were cloned, and what you can see is it's, it's really true, that what characterizes this subset, with the exception of about uh, 5 to 10 percent, is that they all show patterned temporally and spatial patterns of transcription. So they produce extraordinary patterns in the embryo. And the interesting thing to think is that each of these patterns then represents a point in development where having and not having the gene product is reflective of a, has meaning, is reflective, if you will, of a developmental choice. So what we've done in this screen is uh, by looking for embryonic lethals, and probably we could say because of features of the evolution of flies where they, they tend to supply everything they can maternally, by looking for mutations that cause homozygotes to die, we zeroed in on a very special class of genes, those genes whose presence and absence conveys information that is makes decisions. So we can now then begin to describe the division hierarchy of the of development in terms of uh, a sequence of genes expression patterns being on and off. We can re-describe, rather than just simply look at the morphology in that movie, lovely as it is, we can begin to translate that sequence in the, in the, into sets of decisions and choices involve specific expressions of genes. That's a, yes? It depends on both. Yeah. So there are genes that each of these genes comes on at specific times and off at specific times. And they come on in specific places and off in specific places. And they will sometimes do this multiple times during embryonic development. OK. So on the other hand, 
we said this is so we said that mom supplies everything except for these 121 genes but can we get a handle on what the mom is actually supplying and this we see here this will become slightly genetically more interesting than, than we thought initially but to do this if you go back and think about the mutagenesis screen and I'm not going to go through this in great detail yeah A parsimonious way to add it is to have many gene that regulate transcription to be this buffer, right? Because if I'm a cell and I need 20 genes and I could have them regulated by the same transcription mm -hmm. factor, then I, those factors should mainly be transcription factors, right? And that's what it, I mean, is it's, that it's, the reason why you think that you mainly got transcription factor from that? Right? Possible. We'll actually come to that, but it's, it's a, there's this, uh, uh, the idea of what decisions are and whether decisions are always at the level of transcription, or to the extent that transcription decisions are always at the level of transcription, ultimately, your logic is right. Okay, so what we want to do is say, can we get a handle on what mom's contributing? We could think through this screen, and we, say, and we realize that uh, in spite of all those four lines there and this, my messy uh, PowerPoint work, go back to this figure, there is a... Um, this class, where we got the tubes and the white-eyed flies were surviving, where we knew that we hadn't induced a lethal mutation, we could still ask whether now, if we took these individuals, which are homozygous for this mutagenized second chromosome, whether the females in these tubes are themselves fertile. It would be, we have destroyed a gene that is essential for their ability you know, uh, for some essential function that they contribute to the egg. Now, just to do that experiment with this, uh, with these leftover flies, we started it that way, but actually, uh, what, uh, Trudy Schupach and, and Yanni Nusslein, who did the majority of these kind of experiments, realized that it basically meant having to go back and start all over again with another selective system <laughs> to get enough flies to do this, partially because you don't want to manually sort out the red, the white-eyed flies and put them in a tube. You'd like to have some magical thing where at the end you end up with a tube where you only have homozygotes and you can shake them out and uh, see whether they're fertile or not. And so they figured out a genetic screen that I decided to spare you of and uh, just present you with the results. This is just for the uh, Trudy's results from the second chromosome, but they're representative. And they're interesting because they show you what happens if you really try to get your hands on uh, maternal gene. Uh, Trudy set up 18,000 lines. She had to do that because she was using a large amount of, of, of uh, a mutagen and producing lots of lethals. So many of the lines, the homozygotes didn't survive. And there were 707. She had, among her testable lines, she had 7,000. 351, and 528 of these lines, the homozygous females were sterile. Now, what's, and I'm going to leap through a whole bunch of little minor analyses to just let you know what the classes are. This, 178 of these lines had mutations that we know now were partial loss of function mutations in genes that otherwise would have caused lethality. So as you knock out, you don't always knock out total function of a gene. And if you have a gene that's essential for viability, you could imagine that you kind of tweak the activity, get it down enough, that, but still some homozygotes survive, but they're sterile. That's 178. And that tells, and that number uh, so we're going to forget those for a second because the, they're not really specific for oogenesis. There are about 350 mutations that are specific for female sterility and maternal effects. And actually, the way that we know the difference between these is that these mutations give you, uh, can be assigned to complementation groups with multiple hits per complementation group. That is, whenever you hit the gene, you get the same phenotype. Here, for mutations in viable genes, 
to survive. They have to be a very special mutation. They have to just tweak the activity enough to get it down, enough to knock out oogenesis, but not down enough to knock out viability. So it's a very special, rare kind of mutation. But you have a very large pool of genes that can mutate that way. So you get lots, whenever you do the mutagenesis, this kind of mutagenesis, <coughs> you get a lot of genes, a lot of mutant lines that contain mutations that complement all other lines, that can't be assigned to complementation groups, each of which are unique for particular genes, because you're just sampling the viable populations again, but at a partial loss. The 350 mutations could be assigned to 110 genes. So you're getting multiple hits for these. And that assures you that these genes are probably specific for oogenesis. Many of them just didn't make, uh, <coughs> didn't make any eggs at all or were blocked at some point during the, but 28 <coughs> produced uh, morphologically normal eggs. 20, uh, I think I'm not genes. Yes, 28 genes, nor, and among the, I messed up the numbers. How this should be 11, this should be 28 and 11. Uh, anyway, we're going to end up with a small number of genes, which, when you mutate them, the female makes an egg that looks perfectly normal. Everything's fine, but when that egg is fertilized. The embryo is unable to develop a normal pattern because evidently those genes and those products that the mother's putting into the, the gene are, are products that are instructive in their nature. So mother is putting 6,000 gene products in the egg, and there's a small number that determine either the anterior, posterior, or different regions of the embryo, of the egg, and therefore, the regions are the fates of the cells that form in those regions of the egg. OK. <coughs> genes specific, genes that are essential for, uh, oh, good. Why did I just said that. OK. <coughs> and so one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow is what, how these genes work. We know that they produce. Uh, Localized cues will focus on a gene called bicoid that uh, determines the anterior posterior pattern of the embryo based on maternal, a maternal RNA that's deposited in the egg. So, okay, how, how are we doing with other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, what is the function of, the, if there are only 12 that are essential for <clears throat> making a normally patterned embryo, all of the other, <clears throat> everything that you know about from biochemistry, ox oxidative phosphorylation, any in, uh, RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, uh, all the cytoskeleton, all components for the, uh, forming cytoskeleton, membrane synthesis, all of those are supplied to the embryo by the mother. Those are all of these other RNAs that are there. And they are uniform because all cells need to, do, need to be able to do those things. It's the rare maternal gene that actually supplies, it will see, supplies information. Ah. They would, the embryo would die, but if the mother, think about it, if you make a mutation in an essential ribosomal protein, the homozygous individual will not be able to make functional ribosomes, and she, a, she will die. Now, she won't die as an embryo, because embryos get their ribosomes from their mother. But after the embryo hatches out, and starts growing up and increasing in size and volume, suddenly it becomes to depend on its own ability to make ribosomes, its own ability to make cytoskeleton, its own ability to make actin. And it's at that point 
that the embryo dies, or the individual homozygous dies. But they score in our screens as homozygous lethals, and, but, and we cannot easily detect them as maternal effects because they are dead by the time we would have adult females that we could check, test for eggs. Are there other questions? OK. So we're almost halfway. We're more than halfway through. Um, what I wanted to do was to say, well, yeah. So, so far, the picture that we have is that the genomes are made. There are certain numbers of genes. And whether you detect them or not depends pretty much on supply, who is supplying them and what this, when, they're required, when their expression is required. So that in the embryo, for normal morphological for events, you have a small number of zygotic genes, because all the machinery and the cytoskeleton is supplied maternally. You have a small, uh, and, uh, a small number of maternally supplied genes that are specific for embryogenesis. And you can mutate them, and homozygous females survive and are happy. And then you have a large group of genes, which are essential for viability, are supplied by the mother. But we can't study them easily mutationally, because when you knock them out, you, you eventually die when the maternal sources run out. So everybody here? So, but I'm going to say, nope. It's unfortunately more complicated than that. There are other reasons why you might miss genes. So I want to go through two of them, because they turn out to be interesting and intriguing from the standpoint of understanding morphology and morphological transformations. So I'm going to get into this, though, from a historical kind of st <coughs> standpoint. Just to remind you, um, Fly M, this is the movie that you saw at the beginning. They start off, this is an unfertilized egg, or fertilized egg, about an hour into development, forms this, the nuclei div uh, divide. Oh, actually, I have it drawn on the next slide. Fertilization is followed by nuclear replications that, unlike most other uh, mitosis, mitotic events, aren't followed by cytokinesis. So you have a single cell with multiple nuclei. They continue to replicate until their number is about 6,000. <coughs> and then they stop dividing. They uh, enter, they build, they, they increase the plasma membrane that 30 fold to subdivide the embryo into an epithelial, each of these nuclei into individual cells. And then the embryos begin to gastroid. And this cells begin to move around. This, these, this event is the first time in development where different cells are behaving differently from each other, where you would maybe need to program different cell behaviors or different fates. When we look through, and we so we wanted to know what's the, when's the, 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 the earliest time we, uh, earliest time when any of these mutations that are active in the embryo, the first set, there's like 121. When do they become visibly abnormal? And I actually set up little 121 cups and looked at each of these, and all of them were normal until they started to gastrulate, and then depending on how good my eyes were, I could say they're abnormal. This one becomes abnormal at this stage. So I had the conclusion was that the embryo really only needs new zygotic transcription at this point, when cells begin to um, behave differently from each other. That's a great model. I like it. It's not true. Uh, but it's a good model. Uh, and what killed me, I mean, no, it didn't kill me, was what, what uh, the experiment that made me change my mind was you can pharmacologically disrupt RNA transcription. There are different drugs. One of them is called alpha mannitin. It's derived from mushrooms. You put it in, it knocks out all polymerase II activity. And some people had done experiments like this, where you injected them into fly embryos, and you block all transcription. And we would predict that the embryo would come to, to gastrulation and then become abnormal. But the terrible thing was that the embryos became abnormal here, rather than here. And this meant one of two things. Either you can't believe pharmacology, 
which was my favorite interpretation at the time, or that we had missed important genes that were active in this early, in the, that the earliest active genes were the one, were ones that we had somehow missed. And when you, you know, you, have, you can have your preferences in science for what you think you'd like, how you think like things would like to, you'd like to be, but you, there's also you want to test it. So I was trying to figure out, is there any way that I could test and show these alpha manitin people, these pharmacologists, that they were wrong? And so, uh, you know, the other possibility was that somehow we, when you do screens for point mutations, you miss genes. And so it occurred to me that in flies, there's a way of testing this idea because, um, and the way that you, if you could eliminate a whole, the whole second chromosome, for example, and you made an embryo that didn't have any second chromosome, our, the results from our mutagenesis screens would say that that embryo would develop normally to the gastrula stage. Because I just told you there are no genes on the second chromosome that are active before gastro, if we really have identified any. But if you eliminated the second, entire second chromosome and the embryos died here, you would have to say, well, there must be something else on the second chromosome that you missed. So I'm going to, one more complicated genetic experiment, because uh, that's what we're doing today. Oh. Uh oh, let's just go through the logic. The earliest acting genes are affected by alpha manitin. All right, so how do we know this? OK, so this is the most complicated genetics that you're going to see, but it's really cool, OK? Now, normally, um, for the second chromosome, it has a, they look kind of like this, the diploid. They have a right and a left arm on a centromere. And during meiosis, the, one of these two arms go to the eggs, and one, of the two, one or the other of these chromosomes go to the sperm. And after fertilization, you restore normal diploidy. Are there any questions about this? There are chromosomal rearrangements that are essentially like what we were to call translocations in Drosophila, where the two right arms are fused to the same centromere and the two left arms are fused to the same centromere. That's kind of like if you were to break here and here and refuse. And those are just accidents of nature, but fly people keep accidents of nature in their labs and call them stocks. And so these stocks exist. And now if we, and they exist, not only do they exist, but you, they can mate with each other. And so now what's going to happen is this two centromeres, during meiosis, the two centromeres will segregate from each other and give you two right arms or two left arms in the egg and two right arms or two left arms in the sperm. And what that means is if you work through the little Punnett square here, if you look, the total amount of DNA in all these squares is pretty much the same. But if you look at the actual identities of the chromosomes, this little square here has four right arms and no left arms. And this little square here has four left arms and no right arms. What that means is that there are any genes on left arm of the second chromosome, uh, that th these embryos will develop normally, until, well, you know, let's say it differently. These embryos will develop normally until the first gene that's required to be transcribed on that arm. Are there any questions? Get the idea? I bet you can guess what the result of the experiment was. <laughs> This is what happens when you induce alpha manitin. This is what happens when you, leave, when you don't have this chromosome arm. A couple of catastrophic things happen. The embryos don't organize their act inside a skeleton. They don't form cells. They remain a syncytium. They can't transport lipid. There's a, a set of very sad things that happen to these embryos, but not to any of the sister embryos. So it's telling you that this is specific for this arm. There are some genes there. There's at least one gene that does all these terrible things, or there are multiple genes. And so you say, what are these genes? Can we identify them? And now we're going to use a, a, a slightly different technique. 
In addition to these kinds of chromosomal rearrangements in flies, you also have ones where the second chromosome is been broken, and part of it has been hooked onto the Y chromosome. That's right there. And part of it, the Y chromosome, has been hooked onto the end of the second chromosome. These individuals are also perfectly normal diploids. They have all of the genes that they normally need. They're just kind of rearranged. And rearranged means that during meiosis, when sperm or eggs are made, you will get, different, you will get sperm that have different contents. Of, uh, and in particular, there's uh, hmm, let's see, where are we? Here, yes. Uh, well, in particular, sometimes you will get one eighth of the time you'll get embryos that are missing every gene that's distal to the chromosome breakpoint. So, since there are hundreds of these translocations available. What you can do, once you know there's a gene on a particular arm, you can set up these crosses and kind of like march through the embryo making smaller and smaller deletions until suddenly your phenotype disappears. And then you've localized this mysterious gene. And by refined versions of that, you can identify and clone. When we did these experiments, what we found is that the entire alpha amanitin phenotype, all the bad things that happen to the embryos, could be reduced down to eight different regions scattered throughout the genome. Pardon. Fairly good, uh, meaning that other people had mapped based on chromosome morphology, banding morphology, down to three or four bands. Uh, no, these uh, a feature of Drosophila is that they have chromosomes, which um, you can build a map of the genes based on recombination. You can also build a map of the chromosome based on morphological densities of DNA. Before you could clone the polyteen chromosome, these are the, and so you could build a map, and so people had these translocations and they knew where the breakpoints were. So one, two, let's see, did I get the numbers right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so once we figured out where these genes are, we could actually clone them and identify. And they define a whole new class for us. They are expressed. They're not expressed in the mom. They're not there during early cleavage. And they come on right at this point where the embryo is beginning to um, uh, it's stopped dividing and gone into you know, trying to transform itself. They come on uniformly. And they kind of go off in patterns. We don't know whether that's interesting. But the mo most interesting feature of these proteins is that they all encode small, rapidly evolving proteins with poorly conserved amino acid sequence, and therefore no easily recognized human homologs. They are, with, even within the their, their function, and they are essential for cellularization, but their function does not depend on obvious specificities or sequences of amino acids. They have, you know, I, I now tend to think of it, you know, this is probably the way evolution works. When you suddenly, at the end of embryonic development, and you realize you haven't divided the embryo into cells, and you have to make cells, and you have to say, oh, what do I have to invent a new, and you have to fix this thing. It's kind of like the way I fix things that go wrong in my house, which they go out and I buy some plaster and squirt it up there and kind of, um, fix things and in a way which is evolutionarily, which is all that you need to do. You need to do things to stable these, these, whatever these proteins are, they do these jobs. And the, I suspect, and, and this is not unusual, 
it'd be useful to have somebody who does evolutionary sequence, that having rapidly evolving proteins that don't have homology is not a peculiar feature of just flies. Most organisms, if you look at the sequencing data, there's a class of proteins that fall into this. And no one really knows what their function is. And it is, this is probably giving us a handle on the function. Now, if we go back and we ask, well, these genes exist. Why could we only identify them in this kind of screen? Why didn't we identify them in a, 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 muta, a conventional mutagenesis screen? The reason for that, obviously, is that, well, if you're using a point mutagen and you're changing bases, what you're most often doing is changing um, uh, amino acid sequence. And that's not going to knock these, these proteins out. And they're small. And so and the probability of getting stop codons is small. I think, curiously, to this day, we still don't have any point mutations in any of these genes. We do, in a certain sense, because we've cloned them out of, have tried to work our way out from Melanogaster to other fly species. And we've identified the proteins that are 40% similar in this region. And we've taken them and cloned them and put them back into Melanogaster. And they function perfectly fine. So we do now have mutants of melanogaster but simply by taking the Drosophila virilis gene and putting it in melanogaster. That's the only kind of mutants that we've been able to obtain. So interesting class of genes. OK, um, one more. How are we doing? We have five more. What is our timing? 15 minutes. 15, ah. OK. One more set of genes that was hard identify. And I'm going to call this little last five minute section is why is analysis of patterning of morphology more difficult than analysis of patterning cell fate? Okay, and to do that I have to give you just a little bit of the biology here. <clears throat> In Drosophila, if we look at a cross section of the embryo, the cells on the ventral side are going to form mesoderm and they, to do that, they, um, the cells over a 15 minute period form a fold. These cells are going to be the mesodermal cells. And they form a fold that brings these mesodermal cells that are going to form muscle and internal structures into the interior of the embryo. You can maybe watch that process here. And you can see that it's just a simple fold. You bring these cells into the uh, interior of the embryo. You can look more closely at what's actually involved here. And this is interesting. You have at the end, uh, right, before, at the, right before the embryo begins to gastrulate, or you can hear the, here you can see the sequence of cell shape changes that are is producing this fold in the interior. You can cartoon it. And <coughs> basically, what happens is the apices of the cells constrict, and they ultimately become triangular in their morphology. And we can associate that change in shape with a change in the distribution of a, of a motor protein cytoplasmic myosin, which interacts with actin and produces can be localized to the surface of these cells and only to these cells at the beginning of gastrulation. Most of the myosin sitting on the base of the cells. But these cells here that are going to be my, uh, mesoderm, localized myosin, and that contraction mechanically, you can imagine, we'll talk about that on Friday, produces the forces that drive cells into the interior. We're going to try to understand that process in greater detail. But what's, um, so what we would like to do, though, as geneticists is ask whether we can identify genes that affect this process. And so in the original screens that Christian Nusslein Bohart and I did in Heidelberg, we identified two <coughs> genes. <coughs> sets of mutations, two complementation groups, that when we looked at them during gastrulation, they didn't make 
this ventral furrow. The cells didn't move in. It, it, the cells just look like this rather than like that. So these are zygotically expressed genes that must be uh, transcribed to allow this process to occur. We know now that those two genes are part of a, a patterning sequence where a maternal protein <coughs> called dorsal defines the ventral side of the embryo. And these two genes, which are called twist and snail, I'm showing you twist here, are a kind of a complementary interacting cell programming group of cells that say be mesoderm. You express twist and snail in cells, that's what the decision to be mesoderm is like. The cells that don't express this gene are ectoderm. These are the cells that are mesoderm. And the expression of this gene drives this uh, morphological change within about 15 minutes. Now, that's a nice story, but the complication, of course, is that both these two genes are what we call, they encode what are called transcription factors. They control the fate, mesodermal fate. They define the cells as being mesoderm by being expressed in these cells. And their activity is in the nucleus. And they drive, uh, so they drive expression of, <coughs> they drive the mesodermal fate. And part of that fate must be to <coughs> control expression of other genes, some of which would account for this morphology, morphological change. We haven't, and none, and these were the only two genes in the entire screen among the 121 that produced this failure to form ventral furrow. And yet, the screen was designed in its major features to identify transcriptionally active genes. And we're arguing that there has to be a transcriptionally active genes downstream of twist and snail that actually accounts for the morphological transformations. And those, yet those downstream targets of the transcriptional activation could not be identified in the screen, with one partial exception. So what we did is we went back to the translo you know, this complicated translocations. And by once you had um, other genes cloned, uh, you know, the, the genes that were early active, we could add them back as transgenes into these stocks and gradually ask, can we identify what are the are there regions of the genome that are required for mesodermal cells to move in? Not for mesodermal cells to be determined to be mesoderm, but the actual mechanics of their moving in. And the answer is, yes, there are re regions. These uh, combined works from the leptin lab, Rogers lab, and our lab is now identified one, two, three, four, five, six. They have different effects. Some of them seem to coordinate cell division and uh, the uh, cell shape changes. Others involve um, actual assembly of actin or recruiting of myosin to the surface. What is interesting about all of these genes is that if you, what they actually do when you remove them is that they don't eliminate the formation of a furrow or the internalization of mesoderm. They slow it down. They make it irregular. They make it abnormal. It probably costs a certain, a certain fraction of, but uh, you know, it doesn't look very pretty. But these embryos are actually viable. If, you know, if you, if you, in, with one particular, this particular case, it turns out that. We had identified the gene in, in the earlier screens because of a lethal effect later in development. But embryos that are mutant in this region here make abnormal furrows or abnormal, but they 
cells eventually get in and they survive. So which, the picture that you get then, ah, and you can even, and so, the picture that you suggest is that we have these genes and they are, in a certain sense, functioning redundantly. None of them is absolutely essential, but they are downstream of twist and snare. We know that transcriptionally. And they are activated, their expression is activated, and that activates myosin. But you can activate this contractile process by a variety of different steps. And interestingly, if you take and these genes, even though none of them is necessary, if you misexpress them, you activate now myosin over the whole surface of the embryo. So they're sufficient to drive myosin, but they're not the only way, or they're not, and therefore not essential. OK. <clears throat> so that class of genes, so in general, the picture we have, then if we go back and say, what do we get? And this gets close to Stefano's question, but is that if we look back now at the original screens, those screens define genes that must be supplied transcriptionally. Transcription puts products here and not here. If we look at what those products are, yeah, the vast majority are transcription factors or signaling molecules that control the expression, control cell fate, uh, control the localization or activation of transcription factors. So they're things which are local and control cell fate. Their functions are unique, and they produce unambiguous phenotypes. All that means that they were really easy to identify genetically. Downstream targets that affect cell shape and change are substantially redundant. <coughs> They're sufficient to cause cell shape change, but not essential. They're not essential for viability in general. And they require sophisticated imaging to rec recognize and understand their actual function. You only will rec you cannot recognize these in screens that are based on lethality because the disruptions that they cause are not sufficiently lethal. You only identify these functions by looking at an embryo during the process of gastrulation and seeing what is abnormal, you know, recognizing the abnormal abnormality and then mapping the, the functions. So that's the general picture that we have. Uh, The exciting things are that we, uh, in the, this, these genetic um, experiments, have kind of established a, not quite a hierarchy, but an overall cartoon view. You have maternal reacting factors that supply positional information to the egg. They, uh, the embryo responds to that positional information by activating transcription of major control genes that determine cell fate and ultimately determine cell behaviors. But this step here is, as, we see, as we've seen, probably substantially uh, redundant in nature. Now, in the next lectures, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about this first step using Bitcoin, is how you actually go from graded information to transcriptional responses. And then on Friday, what I'd like to do is talk more about the, the mechanics, what we've learned about the mechanics, the, the transfer of information from here to the actual mechanical processes of producing cell shapes. My desire in giving this lecture was to kind of do something where you had a sense of not just where these pictures come from and, and, and where the knowledge comes, but some sense of what's possible with these classical genetic strategies. Um, in thinking uh, over the this morning's progression, actually the whole course, I I had to st uh, stop and and think just a little bit whether there's something special about embryonic development that it was this genetic approaches were particularly useful. There are other questions that have been even raised today that where you could ask, can we? To what extent is a, this kind of genetic approach applicable? You could ask whether elements that intervene between phenotype 
what was really interesting in, the, in this, this, trans, this relationship between genotype and phenotype, to what extent would it be helpful at, to identify the genes that, inter, that intervene, and is it appropriate, or is it the best way of thinking about them as intervening between in this transfer? And this would have, in, in the, your talk this morning, there were a couple of intriguing examples that are, were identified through genetic analyses, essentially, and, uh, but have interesting histories where they, could one expand that approach? Or is it possible to do an organized genetic approach? Similarly, we've talked about control and the kinds of feedbacks that are built into circuits that interpret or utilize information. I'll argue tomorrow, and Art would probably agree, maybe, that what we've identified uh, in these patterns is a kind of an open system without much obvious control, feedback or control in the, uh, the initial patterning processes that we're going to look at. But also, it's true that we, don't, we may not have seen them. Would the screen d design the way we did it have identified any aspects of control? or feedback. And that's something for you to, to think about, or can we redesign or redo the genetics in this way? And similarly, if one thinks about hematopoietic limit, uh, lineages, you can reconstruct a pattern, uh, a potential uh, a proposed lineage based on expression patterns and overlaps of expression patterns. But it's an intriguing task, particularly if you're doing this, if one's doing it in an organism like the mouse where genetics is possible, whether there are genetic insights that would really allow you to test specific ideas yeah. that emerge. So I'll stop there and uh, take any more questions. Thank you, an attentive audience.